الكريم السلام عليكم جميعا وصباح الخير ونرحب فيكم في ورشة العمل الخاصة بالجهات التدريبية في الكويت بمناسبة إطلاق مشروع الإمارات التأهيلية لوظائف واجب التسجيل بالتعاون مع معهد سي اي اس اي معكم زهر الموسى رئيس فريق عمل المشروع ومعنا ماثيو كون من معهد سي اي اس اي قبل ما ابتدي احب ابتدي بسؤالين دو يو هاف اني نون ارابيك سبيكرز؟ في أحد كان حاضر الندوة الأسبوع اللي طاف يوم الاثنين، أوكي. آه رح اليوم راح نتكلم تقريبا عن نفس الموضوع بس راح ندخل بالتفاصيل اللي كانت بتهمكم اللي هي كيفية اعتماد جهات التدريب والمدربين لتوفير التدريب حق المؤهلات المذكورة. آه راح نبتدي أول شيء مع ماثيو من سي اي ساي راح يعطيكم فكرة عن من هو معهد سي اي ساي وشنو هو مؤهلاته. من بعدها راح ادخل بالبرنامج المؤهلات المهنيه اللي راح يتم تطبيقه. بعدين راح ندخل بالتفاصيل مع سي اي اس اي عن كيفيه اعتماد المدربين ومراكز تقديم الاختبارات. ما فيك؟ انا مولي افريون. everybody there are um, trainers who are in training business or are interested in providing training. So um, uh, apologies. Uh, I know one or two of you would have you've already seen this, so apologies for um, those that have already seen this, but I'll just quickly put it through. Um, I'm Matthew Cowan, I run um, the CISI across the region. Um, I'm the regional director, I've been with the Institute for uh, 10 years. So if I just give you a brief um, uh, description or overview about the CISI, really, the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investments. Um, we're actually a not-for-profit organisation, we're a UK charity um, uh, incorporated under a royal charter by Her Majesty the Queen. Uh, we're about 30 years old. We conduct about 50,000, um, 45, uh, 50,000 examinations um, globally every year. Uh, we have about 45,000 members, we're very much focused on that particular space of the industry. Um, we have about 10 offices, or we'll certainly representation in 10 jurisdictions across the world. Um, we um, have a board of trustees, so we have no equity shareholders uh, in the CISI, and everything we do is for um, you know, charitable um, purposes. Uh, and this is, this is our mission statement. So it sets standards of professional excellence and integrity for the securities, investment, wealth, and financial planning professionals providing qualifications and promoting the highest level of competence to our members, individuals and firms. So it, it brings the question really, what is professionalism? I'm sure you, you potentially talk about this in some of your trainings. Um, but we determine um, professionalism as a, as a combination of three things, really. Um, automatically, when you think of the word professionalism, you would all, you, you're thinking of maybe lawyers, accountants, doctors, architects, um, possibly even teachers. But we also see there's, there's um, financial services professionals should be professional. And we, we consider the combination of the three things, which is knowledge, skills, and behavior, and those things interacting is what we serve and create as a professional. So it's those areas, really, that we, we focus on. Um, knowledge, which is you know, clearly um, initial qualification and learning. Skills, how you then people, financial services people then apply that knowledge to their daily activities. And thirdly, how they behave, um, you know, which is a crucial, most important part of what we do now is, is the behavioural elements of it, particularly after the GFC and some of the other um, issues that have been in the industry. So those are our three main activities. Um, the attainment of competence, through examinations and qualifications, maintaining that competence um, through ongoing learning, continuous professional development, and then we um, uh, heavily promote trust, ethics, um, and acting with integrity, so good conduct. 
Um, as I say, we are a not-for-profit, we're actually quite a small organisation really. I mean, although we have a global footprint, in terms of our payroll, we actually have about 170 people on our payroll, of which 140 of them are uh, in our headquarters in London, in the city of London. Um, but, and 40, uh, 30 of them are based internationally and globally. Although we only actually have a small payroll, we actually have voluntary support of around about 750 people around the world. And those people volunteer their time to help us in several ways. Um, they could potentially be sat on service panels, on uh, exam panels, uh, workbook authors, uh, question writers, um, integrity panel. It's a number of ways that they contribute to life at the Institute. The real value for that, though, and the, the one thing that's really relevant for the industry, is it means that qualifications are um, developed by practitioners for practitioners. We don't just sit in, um, in an office, a faceless office tower in London, and design qualifications for the industry. The industry tells us what, what should be uh, examined and what we should do and what we should test people on. So they're, they're particularly relevant for the industry and we then update those qualifications or review those qualifications on an annual basis. Um, so if things have changed in the industry, things have moved on, things need to be updated, we revise the qualification accordingly. And so these are, these are the areas that we operate in. Um, there are, as I'm sure you're aware, a number of different charts of bodies. And one of the one of the things about being a charter body and to be incorporated under Royal Charter is that you're doing something different and unique. So the charter bodies all operating within their own silos, and this is our silo really. It's the, the investment end of the of the financial services professional uh, profession. So wealth, compliance, um, ops, investment management, capital markets, risk, those are all our areas. There are other professional bodies um, such as the Chartered Insurance Institute that focus purely on insurance, Chartered Bankers that are on the, the retail banking industry. So really the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment focuses very much on the investment end of the financial services uh, profession. This kind of gives you some idea of where we are and our representation. I say I'm, I'm sat in the middle there. Um, uh, I've got responsibility for the Middle East, but I also run um, India and also uh, South Asia. Um, so we've got, a, we've got a broad spread, and we're particularly strong uh, in emerging markets, um, that frontier of emerging markets. That's really where our key strength is, where we can complement regulators and we can help regulators improve professional standards. And this then kind of highlights, really, we have uh, formal links with 47 jurisdictions. We are either recognised or accredited or mandated, our qualifications are mandated in 47 jurisdictions and we are working hard to increase that up to about 60 over the next 18 months. To give you some kind of perspective, I guess, of where that place is in the Middle East, um, I mean, globally we do about 45,000 qualifications a year, uh, exam sittings. About 5,000 of those originate from the Middle East every year, and our qualifications are mandatory in uh, Jordan, Qatar, Amman, um, the UAE, um, about to be mandated in Saudi Arabia. They're, they're mandatory here now from, from September. So we've got a, whilst we've got a, a large global footprint, we've got a very, very strong footprint and large footprint across the Middle East. Our qualifications are the de facto benchmark across the Middle East now. And this just gives you some idea of the, the kind of organisations, you know, firms that work with us. Um, I mean, this is by no means exhaustive and, and complete. But 90% of the world's leading investment banks um, provide qualifications for uh, or candidates for CISI qualifications. And we work obviously with um, a significant number of regulators across the region. Thank you, Matthew. I'm going to talk in a very simple way about the program that will be able to help you with the program on the program. 
في اي وقت اذا في اي شيء مو واضح او اي سؤال بليز يعني بس بفرقكم وفرنا اي استفسار اي شيء حابين نشرحها زياده برنامج المؤهلات المهنية راح يتم تطبيقه إن شاء الله على نهاية شهر سبتمبر 2019. الفكرة ما بين الحين إلى نهاية 2019 سبتمبر 2019 هي مرحلة إعداد وتجهيز. إعداد وتجهيز بالنسبة لجميع الجهات المعنية بتطبيق مثل هذا البرامج. بالنسبة للهيئة، بالنسبة للأشخاص المرخص لهم، وبالنسبة للجهات التدريبية أساس نتأكد أن لما إحنا نوصل إلى سبتمبر 2019 جميع الجهات تكون جاهزه، التدريب يكون متوفر آه، وهذه الامور. آه، خلال الاسبوع اللي طاف آه، كان في ورش خاصه للاشخاص المرخص لهم. آه، فهذه الورشه هي بس محدده للجهات التدريبيه. آه، راح نتكلم عن اهداف برنامج المؤهلات المهنيه، برنامج المؤهلات المهنيه نفسه آه، سياسه الاعفاء، اليه التطبيق. آه، من بعدها ندخل على التدريب واليه تقديم تقديم اختبارات المؤهلات المهنيه. اهداف برنامج المؤهلات المهنيه يتفرع الى هدفين، هدف استراتيجي وهو الارتقاء بمستوى الكفاءه المهنيه للعاملين في اطراف عديده لدى منظومه اسواق المال، طبعا من الوظائف واجبه التسجيل. من خلال التعليم المهني والاختبارات التاهيليه وكل هذا بما يتوافق مع المعايير الدوليه. بالنسبه للهدف التشريعي فهو جاء تطبيقا لاحد ثلاثة 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 من الكتاب الخامس من اللائحة التنفيذية وتحديدا بخصوص القدرات الفنية والمهنية لدى شاغلي الوظائف واجبة التسجيل. برنامج المؤهلات المهنية يتكون من ثلاث مؤهلات مؤهل فني، مؤهل رقابي ومؤهل تخصصي. المؤهل الفني والمؤهل التخصصي هم مؤهلات سي اي اس اي المعتمدة على نطاق عالمي وهذه موجودة يعني خلينا نقول من فترة طويلة. بالنسبة للمؤهل الرقابي هو يعتبر مؤهل محلي خاص بقوانين ولوائح هيئة تسوق المال. هذا حاليا جاري العمل عليه ما بين الهيئة والمعهد بس راح يكون نفس طريقة المؤهلات الثانية حتى التدريب راح يكون نفس طريقة المؤهلات الثانية. آه هذا الجدول بالضبط يوضح كل المؤهلات اللي آه تنطبق على أي من الوظائف. فطريقة قراءة الجدول من فوق بالنسبة للوظائف فنبتدي مثلا موظفين المسؤولين من بعدها ندخل بالمؤهل الفني ناخذ على سبيل المثال المسؤول المطابقة والالتزام المؤهل الفني اللي يتم تطبيقه هو مقدمة في الأوراق المالية والاستثمار بالمنهج الدولي المؤهل الرقابي قوانين ولوائح هيئة أسواق المال بالنسبة للمؤهل الرقابي هو راح يكون واحد واحد للجميع ما يختلف على حسب الوظيفة عكس المؤهل الفني والمؤهل التخصصي. المؤهل التخصصي يعتبر مستوى اعلى من المؤهل الفني وراح يكون تطبيقه اختياري بالنسبه للتخصصي. اما الفني والرقابي فهم راح يكون تطبيقهم الزامي. فبالنسبه يعني خلينا نقول لما نتكلم احنا عن التدريب وتوفير التدريب راح يكون عندنا اهم شيء اللي هو الفني والرقابي يكونون الزاميين. التخصصي هو راح يكون اختياري. ولكن في حال الشخص اجتاز المؤهلات الثلاثة يحصل على شهادة معتمدة من قبل الهيئة والمعهد. فقد يكون في حالات ان الاشخاص يبون انه ياخذون المؤهل ويبون انه يدخلون التدريب الخاص في المؤهل التخصصي. هذا نفس الجدول بس بالنسبة للوظائف الاخرى اللي هي متمثلة في ممثلي الانشطة. بالنسبة للاشخاص المرخص لهم اللي يمارسون نشاطهم حسب الشريعة الاسلامية معهد سي اي اس اي عنده مؤهلات للتمويل الاسلامي وهذه ايضا راح تكون من ضمن البرنامج. راح اتكلم بشكل سريع على سياسه الاعفاء. بالنسبه للاشخاص الخاضعين لبرنامج المؤهلات المهنيه حددت حددت الهيئه سياسه اعفاء من المؤهل الفني وتم ربطها بالملحق رقم ثلاثه من الكتاب الخامس. يمكن بالنسبه لكم هذا الموضوع مو وايد يعني طبق فبس حقول بشكل سريع. في سنوات خبرة وفي شهادات مهنية الشهادات المهنية وسنوات الخبرة مذكورة بالملحق رقم ثلاثة من الكتاب الخامس من اللائحة التنفيذية فلو نتكلم عن جزئية مثل المؤهلات المهنية في أشخاص راح يعرفون من المؤهل الفني في حال حصولهم على أحد الشهادات المهنية المذكورة في الملحق رقم ثلاثة على سبيل المثال مثلا في بالنسبة لممثل نشاط مدير محفظة عندنا سي اف اي افارم 
مسؤول نقابه والتزام عندنا مثلا اي سي اي ففي مؤهلات مهنيه اخرى يعني يقدر يقول خارج نطاق معهد سي اي اس اي. بالنسبه لتطبيق برنامج المؤهلات المهنيه الهيئه راح تطبق البرنامج على مرحلتين زمنيتين اساس يكون التطبيق بشكل تدريجي. اول مرحله مثل ما ذكرت بتكون نهايه شهر سبتمبر 2019. بالنسبه ل 30 سبتمبر 2019 في اشخاص مسجلين بالوظائف واجب التسجيل لدى الهيئه. الالتزام اللي راح يكون عليهم هو راح يكون معفيين من تطبيق البرنامج كاختبارات بس راح يكون في الزام عليهم ان يشاركون بالدورات التدريبيه المرتبطه بالمؤهلين الفني والرقابي وذلك خلال مده سنه، يعني عندهم ل 30 سبتمبر 2020 على اساس يشاركون بهالدورات التدريبيه، فعني راح يكون يمكن يعني اكثر خلينا نقول الضغط او الطلب على الدورات التدريبيه خلال هذه الفتره هذه السنه. بالنسبة للمرحلة الانتقالية اللي هي ما بين التطبيق المبدئي في آخر سبتمبر 2019 ومرحلة التطبيق الإلزامي في 1 أكتوبر 2020 مني راح يتم تطبيق البرنامج باختباراته أو مؤهلاته بس مو عن تقديم الطلب للوظائف عند الهيئة عن تجديدهم بعد ثلاث سنوات مدة الوظائف تسجيلها بالهيئة هي ثلاث سنوات فراح يكون شرط عن تجديدهم أن يكون حاصلين على المؤهل هني تختلف يختلف الموضوع مو الدورات التدريبيه بس المؤهل نفسه. بالنسبه للشريحه الثالثه اللي هو من 1 اكتوبر 2020 مرحله التطبيق الالزامي وما بعده راح يتطلب الحصول على المؤهلات عن تقديم الطلب. راح يكون خلينا نقول طلب مسبق. طبعا يعني يمكن راح يتكلم السيد ماثيو بهالموضوع بس هم الفكره ان التدريب اجتياز المؤهلات هو اختياري وليس الزامي. الطريقة تكون عن طريقة سلف ستدي فحتى لما احنا نقول ان خلينا نقول بالشريحة الثانية والثالثة ان الالزام هو المؤهل نفسه في اشخاص قد يبون انهم يدخلون التدريب كانه شيء اختياري على اساس يتاكدون انه يقدرون يجتازون في المؤهلات. في السؤال بالنسبة للشرائح إيه إن شاء الله على نهاية السنة. Okay. Okay. Well, there will be like training materials or syllabus. إيه بالضبط بالضبط. حتى راح أخلي ما في شلون يتم توفير التدريب. Let me just pick up that. I'm happy this to be a you know an answer question session really rather than just us talking to you. So um, so yes, yeah, so the the global qualifications. Uh, those were already available, obviously, and those were available worldwide that they've been taken now, they're available to be studied, they're available to be examined. Um, the one that we are, is currently still under development is the Rules and Regulations exam. Uh, the study material will come out three months before the exam itself is ready to give plenty of time to study. So, so the material, the workbook, etc., will uh, be generated three months before the exam. And we are aiming to have the exam ready for September. So, so we would hope and we would anticipate that the material will be out you know, uh, towards the end of the summer. Um, but it, it is under development. We're working closely with the CMA to to get that signed off and to get that to the uh, launch. Of, of launch. Excuse me, another question. Do you think that the materials it will be bilingual or just lingual? Okay, so um, the material is bilingual. So we produce a workbook in English and Arabic, so two separate workbooks, and also the exam itself is available in English and Arabic. Thank you. Uh, all the qualifications are available in English and Arabic as well. Uh, both study material, the exam itself, except for one. Which is the investment 
Okay, so really, if I just if I just give you some very basic information about the exams first of all, and then we'll talk about um, training. So the, the exams are all available on a self-study basis, that's the first point. But we fall um, uh, way short of providing distant learning. We don't, we don't provide distant learning uh, material. We provide a workbook, a uh, study book, and uh, an online revision express tool that people can revise for the exam for. Um, so we don't actually provide full distant learning packages for, for candidates. Um, neither do we train. We don't provide any training whatsoever. Um, we view it as a, you know, it's a conflict of interest for us, really. We write the answers to the exam, so it's a bit difficult for us to provide training in the next, in the next room. So we don't, provide, we don't provide training. But what we, we do do is we work with um, accredited training providers. So firms that have demonstrated their skill and capability uh, and their expertise to be able to deliver training to a standard um, that is acceptable for us and we would then accredit those, those firms as CISI accredited training partners. The exams themselves, um, they're all computer based tests, these particular exams, they're all foundation level, level three qualifications, they're not um, uh, high level uh, exams. They're all foundation level three, which means that in practice they are all um, computer-based exams, um, multiple choice exams, sat under exam conditions. So we're partnered, we're globally partnered with Prometric. We have a Prometric test centre here in um, Kuwait, and our qualifications are delivered through the Prometric platform. Um, so these particular exams will all be computer-based tests. Um, some of them, uh, the lower level, the, the, the less complex, some of the rules and regulations will be an hour exam um, with about 50 questions, whereas investment management will be a two hour exam with 100 questions. So it ranges, ranges between in terms of the, the length of time the exams are. Um, what else to tell you about the physical exams? Yeah, they're all available in English and Arabic. Um, we recommend to everybody. Um, because of the process the exams go through on translation, we recommend to everybody that they sit the exam in the language they study. You'd be surprised how many people will study in English and then sit the exam in Arabic or the other way around. And the process for us creating the exams often involves us taking you know, Arabic law, translating it into English, um, creating an exam based on English, then translating it back to Arabic, and then trying to uh, match it against the and um, quality assure it against the original um, laws and regulations. So being frank, that that's a challenge for us, and that goes away. So we always encourage people to study um, in the same language that they sit the exam. Um, everybody gets a certificate, clearly. Um, so everybody that passes the exam gets a, a certificate, um, which is available in their portal on our website. Individual candidates register for the exams through our website and book the exams through our website. Um, and firms are able to set up corporate accounts with us and, and the invoice directly. Um, right, the accreditation process, okay, it's, it's actually pretty straightforward, really, and it's, it's, it's just common sense kind of stuff. Um, there's two decisions, really, in terms of accrediting, or two parts of the process. Um, of accrediting the training provider. One is the commercial viability of it. So, um, and that's a local decision, very much a local decision. So, you know, is a particular training provider um, able to deliver sufficient candidates for us? Are they able to attract candidates in? Um, does it make commercial sense for us to be dealing with a training provider A as opposed to training provider B. There's a commercial decision that takes place locally, um, which is predominantly my, my decision, Michael. The second element to it then is a technical decision. Um, and the technical decision is carried out by our accreditation team in London. And what that involves really is, as part of the application process, um, we want to look at um, the facilities of the training organisation. So is, the, is, it, is it suitable, is it, is it realistic and suitable to deliver training, and appropriate to deliver training? Um, are there um, proper 
procedures and policies in place for um, candidate feedback, candidate complaints, um, shoot to cover um, if, there's, if there are any issues, just you know, normal, normal things that you'd, that you'd expect of any, any training organisation. Um, the other element that we then look at is the suitability of the trainers and the tutors. So we'll look at their, um, their CVs as part of the application process. Uh, not only do they have experience of tutoring, do they have experience of the investment business, do they have experience of the Islamic finance. If somebody is a, is a risk specialist or they've worked in risk before moving into training or they've trained in risk, do they have the capability to also deliver training on investment management? So we'll look at the we'll look at the, the tutors see these directly and assess our view on um, their experience and their ability based on their on their CVs, whether they're capable of delivering training for the exams that they're looking to be accredited for. So we don't just provide blanket accreditation, say that's it, okay, you're an accredited organisation, you can train from a regs exam to a masters in wealth management. We don't we don't apply that policy. We look very much at the individual exams the organisations want to provide training for and the cap individual capabilities of the tutors that will deliver that training. So if there's no experience in wealth management, it's unlikely we would credit you to provide training on wealth management exams. So that's really what, what, what we're looking for. That's what the team are looking to assess. And the final, final part of that is, in general, not on every single occasion, but in most occasions, we will ask the tutor um, that is being put forward to, to train a particular exam to sit the exam. And we'll ask them to sit the exam within six months of being accredited. That's a very simple, there's a very, very simple reason. A, it gives us a really good measure of some, whether somebody's capable of training it. You know whether they're capable of passing the exam. So that's one thing. Secondly, it then gives the tutor um, an understanding of the examination process itself and the experience and how we actually test people. And the third thing um, is it then offers some credibility to students that the, the tutor has actually been through the process. So they're talking from a position of experience. So we would, we would generally, not in every case, but in general, we would ask the tutors to sit the exams that they're proposing to train for within a six month period, and it's free of charge. We don't charge for that, but we expect tutors to do that and to, to pass those exams. Um, there is an accreditation fee um, on successfully being accredited. So, um, CISI charged £2,000 sterling to, be, to become an accredited training partner. Um, it's not an application fee, it's, a, it's a, an agreement fee. So if people apply and they're unsuccessful, we're not, we're not charging for multiple applications. But those that become accredited, there is a, there is a fee associated with it. And the agreements that we um, provide our accredited training partners with, with is a three year agreement which is provisional for 12 months. So at the end of the 12 month period, we carry out annual reviews. Um, at the end of the 12 month period, we'll look at the annual review, we'll look at the pass rates, which are the most important things to us. Um, so we'll assess pass rates, we'll assess candidate feedback, we'll assess any other intel that we may have from the industry or from the market, um, together with your own feedback on our, on our survey that we send out to you, and providing all, all is okay, the agreement continues. But it gives us the option um, to sit down with you if there's a problem and to try and resolve that problem at the end of 12 months. Um, so I think that's pretty much the accreditation process. The one thing I would say is, you know, this, there are, a lot of trading organisations here, and I, I'm assuming there's a number of separate, separate firms here. We are always very, very reluctant in going out and accrediting every, every firm that wants to be accredited. Um, 
we are actually quite selective over the firms that become accredited training partners and the firms that we work with. Um, one of the reasons is, you know, it, it helps us to ensure quality and some um, some brand quality and some brand reputation. It minimises some of our risk um, in the market. Um, it also reduces our management time. But also, quite frankly, for you guys, it means that the market isn't too diluted for it to be commercially viable for anybody. You know, it has to it has to commercially work for you, for you people. And if we accredit every single company that wants to be accredited in the industry, then it doesn't work. It's, there's, there's no no, no market there. So we're actually quite selective over, over who we will credit. Um, and yeah, I guess I think that's, that's about it really on the accreditation process. Sorry to interrupt. Is there a number of training providers that we, you will accredit in Kuwait, for example? Not, not specifically. There is no defined criteria in terms of the number that we will credit. But in general, we would work with, I don't know, maybe between five to eight, I would say, something like that, businesses. Um, I mean, in the UAE, we've, you know, we've probably got about um, seven, I think, at the moment, in the UAE credit trade partners. And we also work with, we have some partners that we work with that are global trading partners that will you know, look to work in, in QS as well. So that needs to be taken into the mix. And I'm just very conscious, you know, I'm, I'm sure you all agree that, you know, if you dilute the market too far, it's just, it's just not commercial viable for anybody. So, you know, we have to be, we have to be sensible and not go out and accredit every firm that wants to be accredited, but be, you know, selective, fair and reasonable on those, those organisations that we do. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say, as far as the actual process is concerned, um, I mean, the initial process really is, is an application. Um, the application is, is available under the ATP section of our website. You can just download it, complete that, and send that to me. Because the initial assessment is carried out by, by me and my team. Um, so the application, in the first instance, can come to me. And we're then responsible for liaising with our accreditation team in London to actually go through the process of those that we decide to, to put forward and work with. Um, so the process is very straightforward. Just pull the form off, the, off our website, our ATP form, and then we, we, um, we'll go through the process from there. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Uh, question about the length of how the procedure, how, how long will it take to get the implementation? Okay, the accreditation process isn't actually that long. It's pretty swift now. Um, there was a time when it was easier to get a mortgage than it was to go through the accreditation process, but it's 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 improved significantly now. Um, we would generally look to turn ATP applications around in two to three weeks. Um, the only thing that will the only thing that's time consuming, frankly, is if we have a large number of tutors. So if a, if a firm has got you know ten tutors that they want to put forward to the accredited, then obviously we've got to go through ten individual bios and CVs. So that's the only thing that takes time really. But the, in general, it's a two to three week process. Um, does the accreditation process involve a site visit? Um, yes, but that would be conducted by me. So you know our, our accreditation team in London don't need to come out, <clears throat> and that's just more of a practical logistical thing. I'm here all the time, so. You know, if a, if a business says, you know, you know, we want to be accredited, I will work closely with them. It's not, a, it's not a remote relationship. I will work closely with them. And part of that accreditation process is, I'll come and see you, I'll talk to you, I'll listen to you about your, your plans for the market. What, I mean, it's not, it's not an interview, but anybody that applies, it's likely that I'll go and meet first of all, before we put, before we put them forward. Can you confirm with me that uh, accreditation should be department as well as? Uh, yeah, it's both. It's both really. I mean, we accredit the firm, so it's the firm that, that holds the accreditation rather than the individual. And we don't hold um, databases as such of accredited individuals. We don't accredit individuals. We accredit the firm, but we do look at the suitability of the choosers. So.
So part of that accreditation process is ensuring um, that the tutors nominated are suitable to deliver training. And then and is that the criteria for uh, a professional to be certified or accredited? Um, well, the, not that I'm aware of. Our accreditation team in London, I'm sure, will apply some some criteria and some, some standard metrics. And I'm not aware of those standard metrics. And um, it will be sensible. It will just be normal, sensible, common sense stuff, to be honest. You know, if somebody wants to provide training for investment management, what level of experience have they got in the, in the investment management business for a start? And if they've got, you know, no experience for training, but they've just come out of investment management, you know, we would we would question that. If somebody's worked in the investment management business for a reasonable period of time, they've now also been delivering training for a reasonable period of time, either internally in the investment business they're in or externally with a, with a, a training business, then that makes sense, you know. And if they don't pass the exam as well, we've got reasonable grounds to feel confident that they have the ability to, to deliver that training. When you would be ready to proceed? application of immediately I mean we can we can receive applications immediately so it's as it's as it's as quick as people want to want to complete them. I mean I I am here very regularly and I was just talking to Zara with likelihood is I'll be back here again next week. Um, so you know I, I'm more than happy to start meeting meeting training businesses you know next week and have hold some on and on discussions about the aspirations and the the interest of the business to become accredited. I've got a pile of business cards here, you know, I expect you to, to take one um, if you're interested in becoming accredited. And then, you know, over the, over the next week or two, you know, we can we can all get together individually and discuss, you know, the process needs and aspirations of the business. Thank you. No. Okay. Uh, Mr. Maybe I'll get the accreditation or maybe not. I'm just looking for, for, for a different uh, angle. Uh, you just said that uh, the testing itself can be self study. Uh, you said one of my colleagues here got the accreditation. Uh, and somebody wants to take this test. Uh, he's going to be the testing accreditation place, right? Mm -hmm. That could be the train. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if somebody came to me and said, I want to take, you know, maybe I can give him a tutor from, from my own place. And he would go and register there for, for the testing. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so in terms of the... And, 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 and then after, after maybe one year, if you see how much I'm delivering, you know, customers mm -hmm. to, to these places, okay, mm -hmm. then, then you may be looking at me or looking at the core analogies. Absolutely. I mean, we, you know, the, the relationship between between CISI and our training partners, and actually on a more granular level, the relationship between me and our training partners in Q8 is a is you know it's a, a partnership relationship. So, you know, I'm working with them closely to understand what they're doing, how they're doing it, the successes they're having, any any issues they've got, how we work together to. <coughs> ensure the best candidate journey to achieve that qualification. So, you know, I work very closely with um, the training partners that we accredit to understand what they're doing. But yeah, I mean, individuals book the exam directly with us, they get their study material. Some people will feel very happy and confident to self-study and not, not take training. A lot, another group, which I suspect to be larger, Will want to have physical classroom based training and they'll want those contact hours. And we know as well from our own statistics over many, many years the success rate of candidates that go through um, classroom training is higher than it is through self study. So we encourage people to go through um, training whilst we don't make them. We don't compel people to do it, but we encourage them to do it. And we ensure that there is adequate training capacity in the markets to be working. Uh, just to clarify, the test center is different than the training center. Uh, so, yeah. so the, the, 
I mean, it, it, I mean it's, it's a, yes, it's a it, there, would be, there would be better support in examination centers, so they physically just go there to sit the exam. There's no other, they, there's no other interaction that they have there other than sitting, sitting the exam, and they only go to do that when they feel they are ready to sit the exam, either through self-study or through consultation. Uh, but the test center itself, with the promoter. Yeah, uh, it's third-party exam center. It's not owned by us. It's not not controlled by us. It's not run by us. It's a third-party exam center. Okay, so, so there's two separate things. Okay, so there's two separate things. There's a training center, and then there's an examination mm -hmm. so center. So now we're talking about training center. We're talking about training center, and maybe we can move on to. Yeah, I'm happy to answer. Because we have some people that have both training and okay. test centers. Okay. We have separate just training, not test centers. Okay. Um, so in terms in terms of testing, we have a you know a worldwide global agreement with Prometric to deliver our exams on their platform. Um, you know, we're not a a testing company. We're an exam body. We don't. We don't provide our own testing platform. It's the exams are uh, provided across the Prometric platform. It ensures that we're able to deliver that consistently across the world, whichever, whichever jurisdiction we're in. Um, and Prometric operates their own policies, their own systems, their own their own procedures in terms of setting those exams. And to give you some kind of context, Prometric are a professional exam testing organization. So you can you can sit your you know your CII exams, your um, CISI exams, your CBI exams in the UK you can sit your driving license on you know on a on a prometric test centre. So they, they are a global testing company. Um, we have a global agreement with them that they deliver our exams and they deliver our exams anywhere. So if you wanted, for example, to become a test centre or a test organisation, you would have to form a relationship with Prometric, and Prometric then may say to you, okay, well, we need additional capacity QAs. Um, you know, the test centre that we operate at the moment has only got, I know, let's just say, for example, it's only got 10 seats. The capacity is too great to, for those 10 seats. We can't, can't accommodate the demand in the market. You know, let's let's see what you've got available in terms of computers. I and mean, they might then subcontract an agreement with you. But that's that's a, a relationship that you would form with Prometric. We just go to Prometric and say, you know, you, you test our exams, and and we leave the responsibility of where their exam centres are, the partnerships they, the local partnerships they have. That's 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 them. But we can certainly um, facilitate a connection. For if you wanted to do that, or organisations are interested in that, then we can we can get you in contact with Prometric directly. So we have two separate things. We have training providers. We have examination centres. In some cases, one centre does provide both. It, it, it truly depends on the firm. Some firms are just purely training. Some firms are just purely <coughs> the centre providers, and some firms. Actually, I'll just pick you up on that. So sorry, sorry, just to just. Just to um, contradict your actions, we, we, we actually have quite a strict policy in terms of um, whether you can do, whether you can operate both facilities. I mean, clearly, we don't provide training for our own exams because we think there's a conflict of interest. Um, so, a training organisation also examining candidates who have a vested interest in, in good pass rates, let's, let's face it. We, we have a strict, strict policy on that. Now, there are some exceptional circumstances where that could take place. Um, but in general, those would be with non-commercial organisations, possibly government entities or, you know, um, big firms, you know, like JP Morgan's or something like this, where they have a, a very strong compliance team that will invigilate the exams. It is rare that we would agree for a Commercial training organisations also hold the examinations as well. Very good. Sorry. Um, I had a question last year. How do you think guys about the continuous professional education, the CPE, mm -hmm. uh, specifically? The major concern is how people may need to develop themselves down the road. So, uh, after three years, 
when they want to renew a uh, new industry of journey is there like a list of CP hours that similar to any other qualifications any supplementary program that they need to attend okay so so we as an organization we're, we're a membership one if we go back to the three things that we're active in uh, attainment of competence that's what we're talking about today in broad terms the initial exams and then it's the maintenance of maintenance of that competence. Now we have 45,000 members who are members of the Institute to be able to keep that knowledge up to date and we provide as an organisation lots and lots and lots of um, CPD uh, for people to keep that knowledge up to date. Now that's either in the form of um, online learning modules, um, we have about 100 professional refreshers that will Cover things like blockchain, dot frank, fuck, uh, you know, AML, whatever it might be. So we have about a hundred online. Models. We also have what we call um, our CISI TV. So we record lots of debates, lots of discussions, lots of um, uh, lots of conferences around the world. We put onto our own our own platform. Um, we also have a magazine that goes out to members. We also host our own live events, um, and we get speakers in all those bits and pieces. So CPD is, is, is really, really important to us, and we deliver um, a lot of CPD globally. And generally, what we find is that CPD only really hits people, and only really comes into play when it's um, regulatory required. When regulators um, insist that individuals keep their knowledge up to date as part of their um, professional process, then individuals look to CPD providers, of which we are one. Um, but there's there's a there's movements across the region. I mean, the UK has had CPD for 25 years, um, and lots of professionals do. I mean, you know, doctors need to keep their knowledge up to date, and they need to do continuous professional development. You don't want surgery from a doctor that has never performed keyhole before because they haven't learned how to do it over the last 25 years you know so lots of people have to keep their cpd up to date but and there is a movement across the the region here where cpd is becoming an important part so the uae has introduced cpd um oman has got cpd um bahrain has got cpd um, we are talking to um, Sam CMA in terms of introducing CPD after qualification. So I think it will become a significant thing, and I think the initial qualification is just the start of the journey. Just to add on to that, I have a lot of things that 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 I have a الهيئة اللي هي مثلا يعني خلينا نقول بالشريحة الأولى خلال أول سنة ألزمت مثلا بس دورات تدريبية بس هذا مو معناته أن الشخص ما يقدر هو بنفسه يحصل على المؤهل الهيئة تلزم المنمو نقدر نقول نفس الشيء يعني مثلا حين نتكلم عن أم سي في دي هذه الشغلة الثانية موضوع المؤهلات هي مجرد خطوة أولى لمسيرة جدا طويلة يعني دائما يعني برنامج مثل هذا اول ما يتطبق اول شيء بالمؤهلات لما نوصل حق مرحله ان المجتمع خلينا نقول كله او السوق كله وصل حق هالمستوى من المؤهلات مني نروح حق الخطوه اللي بعدها نروح حق المستوى اللي اعلى بعدين ندخل حق السي بي دي سي بي دي اللي هو الكونتينوس بروفيشنال ديفلوبمنت او التطوير المهني المستمر فهذا اذا طبعا هالمرحله راح تكون موجوده بس احنا قاعد نتكلم عن يمكن يعني سنتين او ثلاثه من اليوم، من بعد ما احنا نخلص من المرحله الاولى هي مرحله المؤهلات. سي بي دي هذا شيء موجود عالميا مثل ما تفضل يعني اذا تتكلم بالخليج عندنا الامارات، الامارات صار لهم الحين اربع الى خمس سنين مضافين البرنامج، فهم وصلوا حق مرحله السي بي دي، نفس الشيء كل دول الخليج، بالنسبه لنا احنا الكويت تعتبر شيء جديد. بس بالخليج يعني اقل اقل دوله خلينا نقول يمكن ثلاث الى اربع سنين طاقه هالبرنامج فهم وصلوا حق هذه المرحله. فطبعا التصور ان احنا خلينا نقول اليوم او سنه قدام 
بالمؤهلات من بعدها نروح حق المستوى الاعلى من المؤهلات اللي خلينا نقول اللي واصلين المستوى العالمي لان بالنهايه احنا قلنا شنو شنو اهداف البرنامج هو توافق مع المعايير الدوليه فاحنا نبي نوصل حق هالمستوى من بعدها راح ندخل بالتطوير المهني المستمر فهني كهيئه راح تحط في التزامات يعني الاورز المينيموم اورز حق السي بي دي شلون استيفاء هالساعات هذه كلها طبعا هي موجوده بالحسبه بس يعني نتكلم احنا عن كذا سنه جدا فاحنا قاعد ناخذها يعني خطوه خطوه بس تصور الهيئه هو وايد اوسع وايد اشمل وايد اطول من بس فقط الحصول على المعاملات. <تصفيق> لا لا it's completely independent from CMA. CMA only it's for regulating securities activities and uh, but the training is not. And as I mentioned, CMA does not offer training. CRSI does not offer training. It's a conflict of interest for both both sides. Any other questions? Uh, I just yes. looked at CMA uh, currently does not offer training, but there's a. A vision different in the future. So we're talking about currently as a regulator, it doesn't provide training. Yes. Um, I want to just quickly go back, Matthew, to the, the point where you're talking about exceptions made uh, for centers or let's say institutes that offer both uh, yeah. the, the exam as well as the training itself. Um, I, I come from a, a university <coughs> representing a university where we offer both. Mm. So. Um, that is, that, frankly, that is the, the, the time and um, the area where we would, we would look at creating exceptions because um, university establishments, things like that, I mean, it's, it's quite common for the testing centre and for them to be testing professional qualifications and it's also quite common for those universities to already have existing relationships with Prometric or some may have Pearson View some of the other testing companies. So under those circumstances, we are able to do a bit more flexibly because you're subject to the, you know, the, um, the requirements of Prometric and the testing platform. And part of that is you know, having a Chinese wall and you know, not being able to compromise the training. So those are some of the times where we look at exceptions. I also have a follow-up, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, so let's move away from just the examination, uh, but the actual training itself. Is there a specific number of hours uh, that the training needs to be, or is it uh, depending on whatever is being taught? At, at that it depends on you, on you frankly. Um, I mean, we recommend in all of our study material um, recommended self-study times. So in all in all the workbooks that we, we distribute to candidates, we say in there, you know, whether it's um, 80 hours self-study time, or whether it's 120, whatever it might be for that particular exam. Um, it's down to you as the professional training organizations to determine, you know, the time that you can deliver effective training. Um, so if you decide, you know, something's a two-day workshop, or it's a, you know, a three-week workshop, it's, it's, it's down to you. And, and I guess as well that, you know, whilst we, we're very broad in terms of the time that we suggest to candidates. It also depends on the capability of those candidates. So, you know, university students that potentially, for example, uh, that potentially have no exposure to the industry will take a lot longer potentially to absorb and to understand than those people that have been in the industry for 10 years and know their market. So, you know, it's really down to you to assess you know, the, the, the course duration based on the market. The question the number of uh, participants of training session uh, is there any specific uh, requirements? Is it going to be like a uh, lecture or it will be case studies, group work? So is there any you can... Okay, so we we provide, I mean, we have an ATP, uh, a currency training part portal. Um, so when you become an, an ATP, you can log into our portal, the specific portal for ACPs, and we have on there a variety of resources. Um, some of the most important resources, I guess, are um, tutor slides. So we provide 
our own tutor slides for the tutors to use if they want to use them or they they, they come up with their own. But the actual um, construction of the course is entirely down to you. So it's it's all about what we are interested in as an organization is the candidates go through an effective learning process. How you deliver that learning, frankly, as a professional training company, this is, is, is down to you. Um, you know, whether you choose to do that you know, through lectures, through seminars, through assignments, through you know, classroom, through a combination, it's, it's really your call. Please. Uh, so, doing the lectures, is that something that you Of trainer. Yeah. Because the challenge that training center will have at the first place is that to find that person with three conditions, correct me if I'm wrong, first to be accredited, then to be a trainer, to have that kind of skills, and to have the experience within the investment. Mm -hmm. So in the, while we are uh, launching this kind of program, do you think that the, the, this will be available at the, uh, that easy for training center to be accredited, finding those kind of people? Personally, I think yes. I think um, I, it's, there's, there's a lot of very good, knowledgeable people around that have got good exposure to the investment industry and also have got training skills. So, from my point of view, I think I think that's available. I think that's you know people could attract individuals that would be suitable for us um, to deliver training. Um, but I guess the question is going to be, you know, people aren't going to know until until they get it. And that's to, to some extent as well, where the accreditation process, because we only work with a handful of companies, you know, a small number of companies, that's actually where there might be an opportunity for you know training organizations to partner with each other and work together. You know, if a particular training company has got, you know, um, uh, an abundance of resources that, that are suitable, yeah, we haven't accredited the business. You know, there might be some synergies between different organizations, I don't know. Um, but I don't, I don't think there would be um, a particular issue in attracting capable trainers in, in the market here. Because they should be qualified also as well within the certificate they are going well, they to need to, They will need to take the exams um, within six months of us agreeing the accreditation. So we accredit the business, and as part of the business is the nominated tutors, 
We would only expect the duties to come to the accreditation process having already taken the exams. We say, you know, they need to take the exams within six months of being approved. Yeah. How, okay, how many registered persons we have, have to attend the training uh, by 2020? So, how many trainers okay, do we well, need to? We've done the math, but it really depends because there's an option of actually taking the qualification without sitting through the training. So it depends. Right. I'll put it this way. I mean, if you, if you talk about the number of candidates that need to go through um, either training or an exam or some form of process, we think it's probably about 700 people that need to go through the process of which they're going to need two qualifications, so uh, that's 1,400 um, individu individual sessions, whether that's a case of self-study, whether that's a case of, you know, directly you know, into training sessions, you know, it's, it's around about those, those numbers. It depends, of course, on the turnover, um, so, but that's an average. Please. For the, the training to pass the exam, it's one exam off, or there is a renewal, a refreshing? Um, we, uh, no, it's, it's, it's really a one-off. Um, and we actually are quite um, vigilant about um, trainers taking exam on multiple occasions. Um, because clearly, you know, um, let's be frank about it, it's possible to harvest the questions if you take the exam enough times, you know, you're, you're able to harvest the information. So we, we ask the trainers to sit the exam once, and it is reasonable to think that trainers will re-sit, take the exam again if we make a major revision to it. So if we go to the exam, we review the exams over 12 months, generally the updates are less than 10% of the exam, you know, so it's a, it's a pretty small update. Um, but if there is a major change, you know, if we completely rewrite and relaunch the exam, you would have thought most trainers would want to, to reset it, um, to refresh their knowledge, and to, to um, again, to go back to the process of being able to different candidates and say, you know, we've, we've done this, we've taken it. But from our point of view, no, I mean, you, you sit the exam as part of the accreditation process, and that's it, it's got, it's got an expiry date to it. Um, but, you know, you would have thought that you would want to revisit it if there's major changes. And the trainer can train also in UAE or in any other area? Well, generally, well, generally speaking, um, we provide the, tra the accreditation for the market that we're looking at. There are some other occasions where, and this goes into some of the commercial decision making, there are some occasions where commercially you might think it's viable. But in the same way that um, we wouldn't necessarily want a UAE organisation coming in and diluting the market, it would probably work the other, the other way as well. And we would be, we'd be cautious about um, granting that accreditation outside of QA to somewhere else, unless there's a really, really good reason. You know, we just have to be mindful that, we, you know, if we've got too many trainers running around all the markets, there's just no commercial value for anybody. And as a result of that commercial value, it means that you don't market trading, which means that actually the more trading companies we have, actually the less capacity we have to provide trading, because nobody wants to market trading for something that's not going to make any money. Um, aside from everything you mentioned, what other assistance will, will uh, a training center get from CIS? Okay, well, firstly they get my assistance, so, you know, anything they need, um, you know, I work closely with, with my training partners, so if they need something, if they want to do something, they've got a particular um, campaign, we have to, um, you know, be careful to remain neutral and not favoring one training organization over another. But, you know, if, if organisations want to work closely, they get my support and we look to see what we can do to help them and, and, and um, you know, particularly on things like marketing, for example. Um, 
we, they get access to a uh, training portal. So there's quite a lot of resources in that portal. Um, so tutor slides, guidance, um, lesson plans, you know, there's various bits and pieces within, within that. Um, they also get, obviously, um, an official CISI um, ACP logo that they can display on the marketing tool, the literature, and, and everything else on, on their website. Um, they get listed on, we have a section on our website, so if somebody's looking, looking for training, um, or somebody wants training, there's a, a drop-down box, you know, they can select the country they're in, the exam that they want, and they'll provide them with um, search results on accredited training partners that, that will be suitable. And obviously the RACPs will get listed on there, um, so there's some, some privacy on there. But yeah, I mean, it's really a case of, we, we, you know, those are kind of the generic things, but really it's down to me to, to be spoken for what each organisation wants. And nothing really is unreasonable, as long as it doesn't involve lots of money. <laughs> we are a charity. <laughs> Is there anything else off anybody? Has anybody else got any further questions? Yes? Just uh, in general, uh, for commercial life in, in, in the whole the whole, the whole the business, uh, especially for the first year, it's only the training. And then, since there is no syllabus for the training and how long is it and all that stuff, uh, that makes it open. Uh, makes it how to yeah, assist how much how to, to evaluate how much the course gonna be costing mm -hmm. the, the, the customer. Mm -hmm. Since it's, it's open, I can give three days workshop. Mm -hmm. Somebody says there were two weeks mm -hmm. workshop and it's only just a training mm -hmm. to get the certificate. And then to, to evaluate how much the cost gonna be, it's gonna be a specific gonna be five to eight Individuals or under I mean, organization, then it's going to be very hard to to, uh, to compete mm -hmm. with each other, especially with the, with, the, with with open everything. There's no syllabus, no time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what I would say to, what I would say to that is that um, the first thing is you know that's that's your commercial decision. You know, if you if you decide that or if anybody decides that it's not commercially viable to you, for them, then they don't apply to be given credits as soon as that. So, you know, that's your commercial decision. What I would say, though, is that um, as an organisation, we um, currently operate and run the Palestine um, rules and regulations, the UAE rules and regulations, the Iran rules and regulations. We're just developing the Saudi rules and regulations exam. And they are all similar. You know, 70 percent possibly of those qualifications, or 60 percent of those qualifications, will involve um, the principles of regulation, as opposed to being specifically rules and regulations from the QA CMA. It will be it's a it's a fairly broad qualification that's then bespoke to the individual country. So although the actual syllabus and although the actual students will in actual fact, I mean we have a green syllabus, but the syllabus is now in public domain. And the workbook hasn't been produced yet and it's under production, you'd get a pretty good steer from a UAE rules and regs or um, the Iran rules and regs or one of the other one of the other rules and regs exams, you get a pretty good steer on that. And on the exam it'll be um, 50 questions, you know, the, you, you're going to be able to pick up some... Uh, I'm not worried about the exam, when it comes to the exam, then, then it's yeah. another category of the training. Yeah. I'm talking about only the training for this the, one. The rules and regulations or all other qualifications? No, like, like, no just the beginning. So, all the qualifications. But what I also ask to that is you, you have to understand what the, what, what the concept is here. Um, the concept is that the whole market will be qualified. The whole market will be professionally qualified over a period of time. And there's a phased approach which enables, during the first phase, people to just undergo training. But the concept is that eventually the whole market will be qualified. Okay, so, you know, if you, 
Whilst, whilst at the moment there is, it is, it isn't um, as it isn't as hard for the individuals that they have to physically take these exams. You know, it's it's that's the starting point, and the likelihood is, why does why would somebody want to go through two days of training for an exam that they have to do, and then not take the exam? You know, so it's. And, and these individuals, why would somebody want to be sat in, a, in an office with colleagues that have become professionally qualified and they're not? So you have to understand some of the, some of the psychology behind this, which all means that I think there is a lot of commercial value for the market because for, for training organisations, because these people will have to take these qualifications, either peer pressure, um, whether the, the mandate, the regs change to ensure people do them. If they want, you know, if they want, if somebody in an organisation that now, for example, um, doesn't have to take training, but they want the option to be able to move jobs at some point in the future, they can't move jobs until they've taken the exams. So why would they not take the exams now that at least gives them the option of moving jobs in the future? So, you know, I think if you look at it from a, a bit more of a macro level and broader picture, I think you'll, you'll start to see that there are opportunities for, for training. Last week we had 10 workshops, and every single workshop, everyone, someone has to mention, okay, even if I don't have to take it for that first year, I might as well take it. Every single workshop, and that's what we advise, yes, do take it. Because if you want to change jobs, if you're in the same company but you change the, the registered position, then it means this is a, it counts as a new application. So at every single workshop, people realize that uh, it's better to take it than to not. Even if the this is what I mentioned, even if the CMA doesn't enforce it, but it's better to do it because at some point you will change jobs, you will change positions. Uh, and the reality is as well is that things only become harder. You know, the starting point is normally the easiest. The, the starting point is normally the, the easiest. The easiest point. So, you know, if somebody, you know, in terms of market, if somebody wants to sit in a, in a role and think, well, they're not going to be able to change from that role now until they have these qualifications, they'll never change from that role unless they set these qualifications. And then all of a sudden, you open up the whole market. Yes, please. Of the no, actually, funny enough, not necessarily really. I mean, one of the one of the um, suitable approaches, as long as there is a um, clear, as long as it's clear. I mean, if you're using hotel rooms, for example, conference facilities to be able to deliver training, and that is part of your, you know, the business's ecosystem is that you use um, external facilities. That's fine as long as it's clear, it's transparent, we understand, and it's you know you're using hotels with suitable facilities, and it's not you know you're, you're operating, operating out of the bedroom of a hotel. You know, I mean, as long as it's as long as it's sensible, then then that's fine, and that's a that's a perfectly acceptable way. And we have quite a lot of training providers that, that do operate in that way. They have a you know an office, they have a central office um, where they're based, and then they use. You know, conference facilities, hotel facilities, to be able to deliver group sessions, and that's perfectly acceptable. Yes? Uh, two, two questions. Do I have to be a credible uh, train provider to do a training for this? Uh, you don't. Second question about uh, freelancer trainers. Mm -hmm. Then they can do this training without uh, permissions or. Yeah, so let me, let me pick, that, pick that up because that's actually a really, really good point. Um, anybody can provide training for any exam anywhere in the world, you know, without any kind of accreditation process, without any kind of controls. You know, if you want to go out now and provide training for CFA exams, you can do it. There's nothing stopping you from doing it. We don't police it, we don't stop it, we don't prevent it. It's, it's entirely down to you. The reality is, however, is that you know it's it's a bit like going to a, a bit like going to a doctor, isn't it? That you know you isn't qualified and you know nothing about. You you'd be reluctant, you'd be cautious about doing it. And that's the same with training. You know, individuals and firms particularly 
they want to go to training businesses that are endorsed and are accredited, and they know that they're going to get their ROI from, from that training organization. They don't want to go to the other qualified doctor. So whilst there's nothing stopping, you know, anybody setting up tomorrow and saying, I'm going to provide training for CII, ACCA, CFA, I'm going to run a training center. The fact that they're not endorsed by any of those bodies, you know, would be an alarm bell to most most individuals. I don't think most individuals would want to do that. Some would, like someone goes to factory drops it, but in general, it's not going to happen. And to add, like what I mentioned, there's something that CMA enforces, and there's something that is what's the real the market. Um, when it comes to CMA for the registered positions, we we will only. Uh, take the ones that are from our training training process. So as CMA, we, we won't uh, accept any training certificate from a non-accredited training. So that's when it comes to people registered in CMA, but if anyone is outside the scope of CMA, that's a whole different story. This kind of should be. Yes, of course. <laughs> is there any more questions for CMA, for CISI? Okay, not uh, thank you very much. Uh,